Hey guys, this is uh, Mr. Roxy coming at you live from Palm Beach in Florida. It is Tuesday evening. It is November the 16th. And today I'm actually going to remove my Oxy hat just for a short uh, few minutes or so and uh, add my veil cap or my wear my veil uh, in terms of sharing some information with you. What I want to do is look at this company called Veil and uh, let's take a look and sort of see what's going on here. And I'll tell you why I'm looking at this one in the first place. So the first thing we need to do when we want to look at any stock for investment is um, check out the news before we go and look at the fundamentals. So in this particular instance, I looked at the news for Veil, and this is not absolutely recent. So it's about six months ago. On June the 10th, 2021, the judge ordered Veil to pay victims, families uh, in the 2019 mining disaster. I'm going to give you some more information about it, about that in a minute. But the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because when I see a stock that's on a huge downward trajectory, and I think this could be an undervalued stock that I might want to be willing to invest some cash into, I certainly want to see the news and sort of get an idea as to why this might have happened. So more about this in just a minute. So what we're going to do is, first, I'm going to just give you the reason why I'm looking at Vale in the first place. Patrick suggested a few days ago, he said, um, can you also look at Vale, a miner from Brazil? High dividend and potentially undervalued. What do you think? Well, Patrick, I'm going to tell you now what I think as I go through this in terms of reviewing the company's fundamentals in addition to the news. Thor said, Vale is very interesting, but on a trajectory downwards, when it reaches approximately 10 US dollars, it'll be a good buy. Thor, we are not too far away from 10 US dollars, so this might end up being a really good buy based on that particular metric. And then Robert Burke said, uh, a few hours ago, two stocks have caught my interest, Falcon Minerals and Vale. Is it wise to own commodity companies? Those are two uh, separate questions, Mr. Burke, because on the one hand, uh, we can look at Falcon and we can look at Vale ind independently or in individually uh, and not necessarily lump them in with all commodity companies because some commodity companies are very good to own. I just don't know if Falcon and Vale uh, specifically meet that requirement right now. But let's take a look at Vale. If you've never heard of the company before, Vale is a global producer of iron ore and iron ore pellets, key raw materials for steel making and a producer of nickel. The company also produces copper, metallurgical and thermal coal, potash, phosphates, fertilizer, nutrients, etc, 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 based in Brazil. And we can see that the last trade today, post market was at $12.13. So not too far away from Thor's suggestion of $10 per share, making it a good buy. What about the company fundamentals? And by the way, if I'm speaking quickly, it's because I have many slides that I want to share and I don't want to hold you too long. Firstly, we can see this is not a small company. Vale has a market cap of $60 billion despite its downward trajectory over the past, um, well, relatively short period of time since uh, it came tumbling down from almost 25 bucks to where it is now at $12. You can see right here on its 52 week range, it is right at the bottom of the 52 week range that $12 and the 52 week high was 23.18, or as I alluded to a minute ago, about 25 bucks. Earnings per share, this is a company that actually has positive earnings per share on a trailing 12 month basis, 3.43. And if we look at the PE ratio, only 3.66, uh, that immediately sparked my attention because this is super cheap, but it might be super cheap for the wrong reasons. That's why we're doing what we're doing right now. So generally speaking, I want to look at a PE ratio of 15 or less. Why? Because 15 is usually the average or is the current average of PE ratios in the S&P 500. And I'd like to buy stocks that are undervalued, which I can get for cheaper than average. In other words, I'm looking for a good deal. Here's the comment about the dividend that Pat Patrick had mentioned to us. The annual dividend yield is $2.70. And at the current share price of 12 bucks, that is yielding 22%. I'm not sure if that's sustainable or not, but uh, anyway, uh, for what it's worth, the short sellers are certainly not betting against this because only 1.3% of the float is short. So, um, that gives us an indication that uh, despite all the bad news that might be uh, hitting Vail, um, not too many people are betting against it. So more about that in a second as well. The upcoming announcement for Q4, which will end on December 2021, has um, a consensus estimate of 61 cents and the previous year's actual was only 17 cents. Um, that would be an increase of 260%, but well, we'll have to see how that goes. It's an interesting graph. I'm not gonna spend too much time looking at that. Let's take a look at this quickly as a snapshot. Here, what I'm looking at is the balance sheet, and I'm looking at it on an annualized basis. 
bales cash and short-term investments. Uh, nice upward spike here. Um, certainly looking good from a cash and cash equivalents point of view. The total debt came down a little and then it spiked up just a little bit. Uh, it's not too bad. We'll get more into that in just a minute when we look at the balance sheet. And the total equity, uh, you know, kind of uh, on a sort of slight upward trajectory here. And um, this is always interesting. Uh, and remember, guys, we always look at the balance sheet and we say, what is the balance sheet? The balance sheet indicates that your assets are equal to your liabilities plus your shareholders' equity. Or the other way around, if you take your assets and you deduct your liabilities, uh, you are left with shareholders or share owners' equity, which gives you an indication of what your investment might be worth. This is quarterly. We look in quarter over quarter. We start off with December 2020, and we end with September uh, 2021, which was the last reporting period that they reported. And we take a look here and we see cash and short-term investments, 74. And this, of course, is expressed in millions. So we're looking at billions, 74 billion, 81, 73, 61, or 62 or so. So there's a decline in cash and short-term investments. That's not necessarily a bad thing because we need to uh, compare that uh, from a balance sheet point of view to the liabilities and then the net effect of that being shareholder or share owner equity. Total receivables, um, last, qu last quarter reported nine and um, the quarter before 28. So, you know, the two ways to look at that, you can say they did a great job um, getting some receivables paid, um, dropping the uh, um, amount of outstanding receivables down from 28 to nine, but then we didn't see that in the um, uh, sort of a cash increase in terms of cash and cash equivalents on hand. Right at the bottom, total current assets, uh, quarter over quarter, not too much of a significant change, but you can see the last quarter reported was only 108 billion. So now when we look at this, we do want to keep in mind the total current assets um, of 108, almost $109 billion. Why is that important? Because we're going to look at the liabilities in just a second. Let's just look at some of the fixed assets here. I drew a big cross here because there's nothing here that really attracts or, or catches my attention. There are a couple of uh, spikes. You can see on accumulated depreciation, there's an uptick there and uh, accumulation of intangible amortization. There's an uptick there. These amounts are not material. And anyway, depreciation and um, impairment charges and things like that are not cash expenses. So uh, we're not too worried about those, but let's take a look at the liabilities here. So the total current liabilities, 87 billion. And we can see that the liabilities have actually spiked up, right? So we were 75 and 67, 71, and now we're at 87. If we go back up two slides, we can see the total current assets right here at the bottom right hand corner, 108, almost 109. And then we see the total current liabilities, 87. So this is a company that um, looks at a glance easily capable of meeting its current liabilities. Current liabilities by definition is usually liabilities that are payable within the next 30 days or so. This is a, another quarterly, we're looking at total liabilities in this particular instance, 300 billion. So what we're looking at here predominantly is made up of uh, large amounts like long-term debt and reserves. So um, that's the liabilities amount. Uh, again, I'm looking for anomalies or, or uh, large deviances quarter over quarter. There are, there are not any in this particular picture. It looks okay to me just at a glance. Then we look at the shareholder equity and we can see that the treasury stocks, the treasury stock are usually numbers indicated by buybacks. When a company buys back its own stock, that gets recorded in the uh, balance sheet uh, under treasury stock. In other words, the stock which was in the open market common stock is now actually held in treasury. And we can see the total equity of the company is kind of, for the most part, static. 185, 207, 208, 181. So uh, down a bit, you know, sort of um, almost 30 billion or so. Um, not really material in the greater scheme of things because the numbers are so large. What we're looking at here is the revenue. So now I've moved from the balance sheet into the income statement and the total revenue. So this is a little bit concerning when you see a company that you want to, uh, obviously any company I invest in, I want to see it growing. I don't want to see it shrinking. Quarter over quarter total revenue, 78, 69, 87. Nice little uptick here, quarter over quarter, and then down to 66 again. I'm not necessarily exactly sure why uh, we have these swings. There might be seasonality attached to it or something else that I'm not aware of. I don't know yet. I'm just looking at numbers. 
and I'm looking at ink on paper uh, rather than the actual business itself. The total cost of revenue sometimes, um, depending on the business, this can also be referred to as COGS or cost of goods sold. So the cost of revenue total, actually fairly static, 30, 25, 30, 30. Uh, nothing there, nothing to write home about, and uh, nothing that attracts one's attention. You can see the uptick in depreciation and amortization, uh, not dissimilar to what I mentioned just a minute ago. The numbers are not material because they're not very large, uh, but certainly there are upticks there quarter over quarter, and these are impairment charges and depreciation, which are not cash negative to the business as a whole. Total operating expenses right at the bottom. Uh, we can see that... Uh, Q4 of 2020 was 69 and then 28, 38, 45. Um, the, the last three quarters is more or less consistent. The uh, quarter ending uh, 2020 seems to be a bit of an anomaly with a total operating expense of almost $70 million. Total operating income, this is always interesting to see because as I said a minute ago, I wanna see the companies that I invest in are growing. So quarter over quarter, 9 billion to 40 billion, that's a pretty decent number. And then 48 is a pretty decent number as well. And now we're at half of that at only 20. So um, a huge drop again, quarter over quarter. I'm not sure why. Uh, probably needs a little bit more investigation. Uh, income before tax. So um, this is where you get into the sort of uh, fudgy numbers from an accounting point of view, because it's in the tar, you know, earnings before interest and in amortization, depreciation, et cetera, taxation. Uh, you can see... Right at the bottom, income before tax, 5 billion jumps to 40, jumps to 50, and now down to 18. Uh, so once again, quite a large swing. Not, not exactly sure why we'll uh, see as we go along. What about the financial strength analysis? So I don't have enough information on, on Vail because it's a Brazilian company, and I'm using my US um, snapshot here uh, to look at the company. But what I can see is the percentages. So if we look at total debt to total capital, uh, pretty much in line with the industry, 28 versus 31. The change in debt, uh, negligible, and uh, once again, in line with the industry. The quick ratio, uh, it's not good. We wanna see a quick ratio of one or above. The one or above would mean that they have enough current uh, assets and uh, cash and cash equivalents to meet their current liabilities. So we want a number of one or greater. They're very close to one. But look at the industry, it's actually 2.21. So the industry is outperforming well in terms of making sure that they have cash and cash equivalents on hand in order to settle their debt. But it doesn't matter because look at Vail, when you look at the interest coverage ratio for the most recent quarter, 111 times interest coverage. So um, they have no problem whatsoever repaying their debt. The industry is high at almost 46, but Vail is at 111. Evaluation analysis, because Vail is in the metals and mining industry and has positive earnings, the PEG, PE, and price to book ratios are most appropriate. Price to sales is not really instructive, so I've just crossed it off here with a little red cross. Look at price to earnings, so PE, uh, Vail, as I said at the start of this video, only 3.6, the industry is at 11. Now, the entire industry is therefore cheap at 11, but Vail specifically is only at three. Uh, very, very attractive PE for me there. Price to book, Vail, once again, 1.8, the industry 3.7, and the PEG ratio, 0.32 versus the industry is almost zero. Um, those are good numbers that are very, very supportive of a potential uh, uh, look at Vail as a, um, an addition to, uh, to my portfolio. I don't have anything in the uh, metals and mining um, from a positions point of view. I don't have anything that's currently in the commodity market. So uh, uh, this is interesting to me at a personal level as well. Gross profit margin, huge, 61%. The industry is uh, pretty pretty good at 40, but Vail, Vail is tracking at 60. And operating profit margin, 40, almost double the industry's profit margin. And look at the net profit margin, Vail over 30% compared to the industry's 8.73. The dividend analysis is ridiculous. Vail paying a dividend currently, as I said earlier on, of almost $3, which currently at this $12 share price yields almost 22%. Um, and by the way, that uh, uh, ex-dividend date is coming up shortly. I think it is November 23rd or something from memory. So uh, if you are uh, in a position with Vail prior to November 23rd, then uh, that would be applicable and you would receive that dividend. Dividend change, uh, Vail's dividend um, percentage change, 111%. And dividend growth, 
uh, rate over the past three years, 13%, just lagging the industry a little. But you can probably understand that uh, their uh, dividend growth over the past three years is lagging a little, given the fact that they had all these uh, negative things happening to them, like dam collapses, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, our friends at TipRanks, my analyst, my analyst friends, have uh, Vail Neutral. Why do they have Vail Neutral? Well, we'll see in just a second. I'll show you why. Blogger opinions are overwhelmingly bullish. Now, I have noticed this in my email inbox. I've noticed this on the comments on our YouTube channel where we uh, have good discussions going on. Lots of bullish comments related to Vail. Investor sentiment overwhelmingly positive as well. Technicals are somewhat negative. I'm not really a technicals guy. I'm not a chartist either. I'm more a fundamentalist. And the return on equity at 52% is good. And the asset growth at 8% is also good. The neutral rating on tip ranks is as a result of two analysts saying buy, two saying sell, and six saying hold. So you get to neutral. Two buys, two sells, six holds. So the consensus basically is hold. But look at the price target, right? So even the lowest price target is $15, and currently we're trading at about 12. The um, average right now is 18%. And a uh, few people have said that this is going to double in the next uh, 12 months to 24. It's currently at 12, right? So based on the 10 sell side analysts who offered a 12 month price target in the past three months, analysts predict a 46.23 increase from today. That's how you get to the $18 from uh, 12 to 18 is almost 50%. That's how you get to the 46. Uh, what's in the news? Vail, the Brazilian mining company responsible for two deadly dam collapses since 2015, has another dam that's at imminent risk of rupture, the government ordered warned. Liquefaction also caused the collapse of the Vail tailings dam in 2019. That's just two years ago, guys, at Bruma Dino Municipality, also in Minas Gerais. Forgive me if I'm slaughtering the uh, Brazilian Portuguese language. Uh, killed nearly 300 people. It's awful news. That's one of the reasons why Vail just went. 2015 collapse of another Vail dam in Mariana in 2015 caused extensive pollution and is considered Brazil's worst economic disaster to date. So guys, that's kind of like a quick snapshot on Vail. And before I sign off, what I want to do is I want to leave you with uh, this. Uh, let me quickly get my screen back here. I will leave you with this uh, little bit of news here. So um, this is the most recent news I found on, on Vail. It's October 6, 2021. Damn disasters were a wake-up call for Brazil's Vale, its CEO says. After two deadly dam disasters that made, made Vale the pariah of the green, global green movement, Brazil's largest mining company is striving to put the environmental and climate at the heart of its business. So yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure and I can confidently say this affects and impacts almost every single fossil fuel and mining company today. If you're not thinking green, you're not going to be thinking for too long. You just have to uh, abide by the uh, sort of global green movement. Doesn't mean you have to comply in full, but you need to pay attention, right? Um, I think everybody woke up. I think the incidents, the tragedies, unfortunately pushed us to open our minds. It's driving force behind everything we do here at Vail. And that's driving force for the industry as well. Beyond improving safety, help Vail reconsider its wider role too, said Mr. Bartolomeo. We need to give back to society. We are a mining company. We extract natural resources. We are only going to be expected, uh, accepted if we share value with society. Vale plans to invest between $4 billion, this is US dollars, not uh, Brazilian money, and $6 billion to reduce emissions by 2030, aiming to cut its direct and indirect carbon emissions by 33%, and it plans to hit zero net emissions by 2050. Uh, let me show you this uh, cool thing that they are doing here. So Vale is developing a new iron ore pellet that aims to reduce the emissions of its steelmaking clients, the so-called green bricket. The result of nearly 10 years of research and development will be produced in 2023. It is made up of iron ore and a technological binder solution, which includes sand from the treatment of mining tailings in its composition, and it is capable of resisting high blast furnace temperatures without disintegrating. 
This is a new pallet, but a new pallet with 80% less carbon footprint. The estimate is that in the long term, the company will have the capacity to produce over 50 million tons per year of the green briquettes generating value as well as environmental gains. So uh, guys, that, that is a, a sort of a, a snapshot on Vail from a fundamentals point of view and um, an overview of the company itself. Uh, are, you in, are you invested in Vail? Are you long? Um, if you are, let me know and maybe uh, share the thesis for your investment with us. Um, I am looking at this one because I'm thinking this is something that I might potentially, uh, as I said, dip my toes into the water with and open a small position with and um, we can see how it goes. I specifically likely uh, the dividend uh, as an older guy who um, needs to also uh, ensure that I don't take too much risk. Uh, a dividend, especially a high dividend like that, provides a bit of a hedge against uh, a further downturn in the um, price of the stock on the open market. So those are my thoughts on Vail. Let me know what you think. I look forward to hearing from you. Bye-bye.